the story of John Henry Patterson. Flowing through Dayton, Ohio, is a narrow sluggish canal which runs past a row of ugly frame buildings. One of these buildings is the office of the toll collector, and in the year 1868, the collector was a young man of 24, John Henry Patterson. Many a night after the lights of Dayton had blinked out, young John Patterson worked at his desk listening to the swish of water beneath the cracked window. Ten pounds of coal. Let's see, that makes five dollars and sixty-three cents. And fifty pounds for... Oh, howdy, John. <laughs> well, you're working late again, huh? Stephen, I just can't make these accounts tally. <laughs> what are they, canal tolls? No, it's this coal and wood business I'm running on the side. The figures just don't add up right. Oh, don't you worry about them. You're my brother, Stephen. I can talk to you. Go ahead, you can. Tell me what's wrong. Well, I'm nearly 25 years old. And what am I doing? Sitting on the edge of a canal like a frog, making $10 a week and what little extra I can rake in from coal and wood oil. Oh, you won't be here all your life, you know, or you've had a good education. Yes, but I'm not fitted for anything. And there's no future in collecting coal. Well, there may be a future in the coal business. Say, say, we might get together. How? Well, I'm out of a job now, and I know where I can borrow a horse and wagon. I could hustle orders and deliver the coal myself. If I were successful, you could quit the canal and we'd set up a business place across town. Would you do it, Steve? It'll be hard work. Yeah, I don't mind. These blamed accounts take up most of my time. You know, it's too bad somebody can't invent a machine to add up figures and keep track of that. <laughs> well, a machine like that would be pretty near impossible. Well, maybe, but think of what you could do with it. Take this Thompson account, please. Mr. Thompson sent the bill back to me, that it wasn't figured right. He wouldn't dare do that if the bill was added up by a machine. <laughs> you better stick to mathematics. They'll never invent a machine that can add. Well, perhaps not. But if it ever is invented, I'll be among the first to buy one of the doggone things. The Patterson brothers entered into partnership, but it was six years later before John Patterson left his job on the canal. Then, for another eight years, the brothers labored at their coal business, becoming the leading retail merchants of Dayton. It was on a May day in 1882 that John Patterson came to the turning point in his life. Uh, now, John, <laughs> what on earth do you call that contraption? It's a cash register, Steve. A firm here in town makes them. Well, what's it for? Well, you see these keys? Uh -huh. Whenever a clerk makes a sale, he presses one of them down, registering the amount. The machine punches a hole into a roll of paper. Then, at the end of the day, you add up the number of holes for each amount and compare it with the cash in the drawer. Uh, how much you pay for it? Fifty dollars. Well, well, are you crazy? Fifty dollars for this? Well, we've been losing a lot of money lately. I don't know where it goes, so I'm putting these cash registers in all our stores. Uh, did you buy more, th more than one? Yes, one for each store. Oh, John. Now, don't shrug your shoulders, Steve. I have an idea I'll find out where a lot of our profits have been disappearing. Well, Mr. Jones, the paper on the register tallies up with your cash exactly. I'm glad to hear that, sir. How long have you been with us, Jones? About six months. And how long has it been since we put in these cash registers? Mm, about three months. And every night for three months, your cash is balanced up exactly with the register? Yes, Mr. Patterson. Mm, that's all I wanted to know. Jones, you're fired. But, sir, if my cash is balanced up exactly... You weren't with... smart enough to get away with it, Jones. Your accounts tallied too well. <laughs> they were too perfect. You made no allowance for human error. The cash register's a machine, but a man isn't. A man's bound to make mistakes. But you can't prove... I can I... prove that you've not been registering all the sales. You've been counting the cash at night and working the register to balance with the amount. I've had a detective watching you for the last five days. Oh, sir. You won't send me to prison. No, but you'd better start traveling. Because you won't get another job in Dayton. And at the next place you work, make sure that they don't have a cash register. After installing the cash register, the Patterson Coal business showed an increased profit until 1884, when due to operating difficulties, the concern began to lose money. John H. Patterson sold out and emerged with $16,000 in cash. Remembering the invention that had saved him hundreds of dollars, Patterson purchased a national manufacturing company, producers of the cash register. 
But the very next day, at the home of the company's former owner, George Phillips... Mr. Phillips, I've been thinking a lot about the contract I signed with you last night, and I... You want to back out, eh, Patterson? I'll give you $100 to consider our contract the nose. I'd take the cash register business off your hands, but since you like it so well and believe it has such a great future, I... Well, I don't like to deprive you of it. <laughs> Sorry, Patterson. A deal's a deal. I'll give you $500. Nope. I'm too glad to get out of the business. What would you say to $2,000? $2,000 if you'll tear up the contract. <laughs> Look, if you were to hand the cash register business back to me and say, George, I'll make you a present of the stocks, I still wouldn't take it. <laughs> Sorry. All right, then. I'm going into this business, and I'm going into it right. I'll make this thing a success if it takes every penny I have. And you're the gentleman that's going to be sorry. Thus, at the age of 40, John H. Patterson took charge of the National Cash Register Company, an organization with 13 employees and four pieces of machinery. Slowly, through incessant advertising, the company began to expand, and the machine was gradually improved by new patents. The cash register became like a growing child to John Patterson. He took pride in its development, struggled to achieve its perfection. Daily, a group of curious visitors wandered through the factory, led by a trim man with a flowing white mustache. Over here, gentlemen, is a line of registers ready for market. Just step this way, please. Now, every one of these registers is perfect. Nothing goes out of this factory unless it is right. See how easily the keys work? I press down on this one, and it rings up for five dollars. Then, when I take my finger off the key, hmm, That's strange. <laughs> Looks like the key is stuck. <laughs> yes, yes, the key is stuck. There seems to be something wrong with this one. I'll have to fix it. Oh, Jim, hand me that mallet. Sure. What would you be wanting with the mallet? Here, give it to me. Yes, sir. Why, good Lord, he's breaking it up. Look. As I was saying, gentlemen, nothing goes out of this factory unless it is absolutely perfect. <laughs> For years, nothing went out of the National Cash Register Company that was not absolutely perfect. But in 1894... Yeah, Mr. Patterson, we are returning 300 of your cash registers. And sorry to say that the machines have not proved successful. Regretfully, Henry... It's a great disappointment that we're returning 400 of your cash registers. Evidently, you have not perfected the apparatus. <laughs> I don't know what's wrong, Stephen. We sent $50,000 worth of cash register to England, and every one of them was sent back because of faulty workmanship. Well, what does the superintendent say? Oh, he doesn't know the reason for it. You know, I once broke up a machine because a key wouldn't work right. But this is more serious. I'll have to find out why these registers are defective. One more incident like this, and we'll go out of business. Now, uh, why don't you have a long talk with the superintendent? No, and... no I'll do something better. I'll move my desk right down on the floor of the shop where I can be close to the work and see what the men are doing. It's the only way, Stephen. The only way we can overcome the difficulty. Listen, Conway. As man to man, I want to ask you a question. What's wrong with you? Well, Mr. Patterson, I hate to say this, but the fact is too dirty for a man to do his best work in. Is that all? Drinking water's bad, and most of the men don't have lockers. And also, if there's only a decent place around here where we could eat lunch. Mm, I'm beginning to understand now. Oh, I ain't complaining, sir, but we can't work as we ought in conditions like this. From now on, things are going to be different. I'm going to clean up this factory, put in larger windows, and give you men a comfortable place to work. Mm, thank you, sir. I've been blaming the men for these defective registers. It wasn't your fault. It was mine. I paid $50,000 for this lesson. I'm beginning to believe the lesson was worth it. As a perpetual reminder, John Patterson had the defective registers placed in a huge glass case. And from then on, he spared no expense in providing for the health, welfare, and happiness of his employees. 
New buildings were erected with large, sun-giving windows. Gardens, schools, picnic grounds became a part of the organization, and Patterson's influence was extended to the whole city of Dayton. On March 25, 1913, a great rain descended on the Miami Valley. Flood waters began to rise, menacing the levees around Dayton. At 7 o'clock in the morning, a swirl of muddy water raged through the city, swallowing every object that remained in its path. But on the high ground above the city, a group of clean, well-lighted buildings offered refuge to the homeless, food to the hungry, and medical care to the injured. Gentlemen, I have been expecting this blood. I now declare the National Cash Register Company out of commission. And in its place, I proclaim the Citizens Relief Association. Here is its organization. My carpenters are building boats to rescue those who are stranded. I've brought in doctors from all over the country. We have plenty of food and drinking water. The flood has come. We have expected it. And now we will rise to the emergency. In the black flood-swept year of 1913, John H. Patterson spent over a million dollars in aiding the stricken city of Dayton and entered it as operating expenses in the books of the National Cash Register Company. On May 7, 1922, he died at the age of 77. A man who late in life started on the road to wealth and who regarded money simply as a means of helping the unfortunate. John Henry Patterson... Captain of Industry.